Since 2004, Joyce E. King has served as the Benjamin E. Mays Endowed Chair for Urban Learning, I'm sorry, Urban Teaching, Learning, and Leadership, and Professor of Educational Policy Studies in the College of Education and Human Development at Georgia State University. Previously, King held senior academic affairs positions as provost at Spelman College, associate provost at Medgar Evers College, part of CUNY City University of New York, and associate vice chancellor for academic affairs and diversity programs at the University of New Orleans. She was the director of teacher education for 12 years at Santa Clara University and the first head of the Ethnic Studies Department at Mills College. Dr. King completed two prestigious leadership programs, the American Council on Education Fellowship at Stanford University with the President, the Vice President for Planning and Management, and the Office of Multicultural Development. As a W.K. Kellogg National Fellowship recipient, King also studied women, women's leadership and grassroots participation in social change in China, Brazil, France, Kenya, Japan, Mali, and Peru. Widely respected in the fields of urban education and the sociology of education, King's research has contributed to the knowledge base on preparing teachers for diversity and curriculum theorizing through her scholarship, teaching practice and leadership. She served on the Curriculum Commission of the State Board of Education. Recent publications include the Harvard Educational Review, the Handbook of Research on Black Education, the Handbook on Research on Teacher Education and Voices of Historical and Contemporary Black Pioneers. In addition, King organized and edited a landmark book, Black Education, Transformative Research and Action Agenda for the New Century that was published for the American Educational Research Association in 2005. King has served as co-editor of the top-ranked Review of Educational Research, and her concept of disconscious racism continues to influence research and practice in education and sociology. In, the, in sociology in the US and in other countries. Her most recent publication is a 2014 book, Remembering, Remembering History in Student and Teacher Learning, an Afrocentric and cultural, Culturally Informed Pracy. King has lectured in educational and community organizations in the United States, Brazil, Canada, England, Mali, Senegal, Japan, Jamaica, and New Zealand. She has shaped her expertise in diversity transformation as a training consultant with civic and human rights organizations and higher education institutions in the United States and abroad. She is also president of the board of directors of Food First, a dynamic and visionary teacher slash scholar. King has a wealth of academic administrative and leadership experiences in public, private, and nonprofit settings, including historically black and predominantly white colleges and universities. She has created numerous opportunities for emergent leaders of diverse backgrounds to progress in their careers. Her accomplishments reflect an emphasis on innovative interdisciplinary scholarship culturally connected teaching and learning, and inclusive, transformative leadership for change, often in creative partnership with communities. It is a real honor for me to welcome Dr. King to the podium. Please join me in welcoming her to the Auburn Avenue Research Library. Thank you, Anthony. Well, um, it's an honor for me to be here today, and I'd like for you to give an applause to Anthony Knight and the foundation, the Khan Foundation, for something coming out of the community for the community. 
Um, and I'm going to offer a little bit of an apology. I had my grandchildren with me last week, and so they left me with a cold. And um, if I start coughing, just bear with me. I have some water here, but <clears throat> I didn't have much of a voice this morning, so I'm going to try to do this. And I also want to say um, it's an honor and a privilege to be at Auburn Avenue Library. I'm originally from California, or my husband says originally from Africa. That's, that's true, too. Um, but um, my father's family is from Marietta. My first time coming to Atlanta was in the 60s when I was a student. I came to a black education conference organized by Preston Wilcox, and we marched from Vine City down somewhere following Queen Mother Moore. Um, just to kind of give you a sense, those of you who know something about that period of time. Um, so my opportunity to speak here at this historic space is most sincere. What I'm going to try to do is give you some highlights. And Anthony, thank you for that bio. I think I could just sit down, you know, after you, <laughs> you went through all of that. You got some stuff I had even forgotten about. Um, but I have had a career as an academic and um, as a, an activist scholar. So something that's not in the bio that um, Anthony presented to you is some of the organizing work that I've done, particularly with parents. And so I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, I was going to bring several books just to show you, but... Um, those are available online, and uh, I'm still writing. A lot of these things uh, have been on my mind and in my sort of in my hand for quite a long time. I was an undergraduate at Stanford University in 1965. I went as a freshman into the first class at Stanford that had more than four black students. And the summer before that, I was working in the fields cutting onions with my family. So I have bridged, you know what cutting onions mean? It doesn't mean cutting them up in the kitchen. It means being out in the hot sun at 4 o'clock in the morning, cutting the tops off and putting the onions in a burlap bag and then trying to get 15 cents for that bag. So I have a really strong commitment to keeping that bridge open between the university and the community. Because when I went to Stanford as a freshman in 1965, I learned very quickly that if I wasn't careful, I would leave there having somebody else's mind, not my own. And so all the work that I've done with curriculum and teacher preparation and organizing with parents has really been about trying to have a space for us to have an authentic education um, in our own interests. And I'll start with this um, slide from, this actually came into my computer a few years after my friend and teacher, Baba Asa Hilliard, passed away. It just appeared in my computer like a message from the ancestors. And this is the 10th anniversary of his parting, his home going. And I just want us to situate ourselves in this long tradition of work, that it's not about an individual, but it's about a long tradition of excellence and struggle and dedication to humanity and humanity's well-being. So this says my art, ancestral excellence. Don't cry for me, daughter. I want you to promise me one thing. I want you to promise me that you're going to tell all the children my story. And this is a scene from the Day of Judgment in ancient Egyptian or Kemetic cosmology. This is how our far back ancestors in ancient Egypt understood the world. And they said that on the Day of Judgment, when you make your transition, your heart will be weighed on the scale of justice. And your goal is for your heart to be as light as a feather. And so our time on earth, our time in this dimension, 
It's something about wanting to be worthy that our contributions, the way we've lived, can be judged as uh, having been worthy. And I think about that and it motivates me. So our ancestral legacy goes back really far. And this is another way of thinking about that. Hatshepsut, who was the female pharaoh in the fifth dynasty of, uh, I'm sorry, the fifth pharaoh of the 18th dynasty. And she said, I have raised up that which was in ruins. I have restored that which was destroyed. I think the Knight Foundation is about that ethic. And I think those of you who are here on a Sunday afternoon when you could be somewhere having a picnic, watching TV, doing other things, are also in that line of understanding what our ancestral legacy calls for among us. And I'm going to say a little bit about black and white as we go along. I'm going to talk, I'll say a little bit about what this concept of disconscious racism means. But I want you to pay close attention that I'm using words in maybe some ways that you haven't quite thought about. So when you leave here, I want you to be able to say, you know, that has given me something to really think about, something to do, something to pick up and pick up that legacy and work with it, no matter what your background. So Baba Asa and uh, Barbara Sizemore said, our children must be given the opportunity to experience appropriate cultural education, which gives them an intimate knowledge of and which honors and respects the history of our people. Generally, when I do talks, it's much more interactive, but I have a very short time today. And these are just highlights. Almost every slide that I put up, we could do a whole day's workshop on it. So I'm going to move through this rather quickly, and I ask you to bear with me just to get this information out. And there'll be other times when we can be together and be more interactive. For instance, I often start my workshop asking people, do you eat grits? How many people eat grits? OK, some people didn't raise their hand. Uh, how many people eat their grits with salt and pepper? Mm-hmm. How many people eat their grits with butter and sugar? That's my people. <laughs> now, that's a question that when I do this in a workshop, you haven't seen the passion. The salt and pepper grits eaters look at the sugar and butter grits eaters and say, where y'all from? But we're one people. And we have different traditions within that diversity. And so that's something that also we want to come away from this talk today with. A um, lot of talk going around about, especially at Georgia State now, because Georgia State is now graduating more African-American students than any institution in the country. Did you know that? More than all the HBCUs more than any other institution in the country. Georgia State's administrators have been invited to the White House three or four times. Millions of dollars flowing into Georgia State as uh, this effort to educate the underserved is now being quite successful at Georgia State. The president of Georgia State now has his office across the street on the top of the former Atlanta Life Building. I'm not commenting, I'm just sharing the information. But let's look at what Carter G. Woodson said. Carter G. Woodson said, it may be of no importance to the race to be able to boast today of many times as many educated members as it had in 1965 if they are of the wrong kind if their education is of the wrong kind, if they are miseducated, the increase in numbers will be a disadvantage rather than an advantage. Are you hearing me? So who's going to say what kind of education we need? We just grateful because somebody let us in? My generation, when I went to Stanford in 1965, didn't have black studies didn't have African-American studies, didn't have women's studies. But my generation called a halt 
We said, you're not going to miseducate us anymore. We locked up the president and the board of trustees until they gave in. They said, uncle. But that was then, and this is now. So Carter G. Woodson, all the way back to 1930, warned us about what is this education thing all about from the preschool all the way up to post-secondary. It's the same issue. So I'm going to talk about some big ideas very quickly. I have about 25 minutes to go. The International Decade of People of African Descent was declared by the UN in 2015. Y'all know about that? Some people, raise your hand if you know about the International Decade. Well, we're on the global stage. The international decade is saying every country all over the world where there are people of African descent should be doing some things because of the injustice that is still being visited upon people of African descent. Native Americans had their decade. I don't know, maybe the Latinos will get theirs if they can get more unity. You know, they're not all the same. Um, so we're also in the throes of a renewed discussion about reparations. Uh-oh, she didn't say that. Yes, I did. Um, so my work has introduced some concepts into these discussions. I talk about diaspora literacy, that we should be able to recognize ourselves wherever we are in the world. I have been in Brazil, I have been in West Africa, I have been in East Africa, and that notion of diaspora literacy, being able to read our culture wherever we are, is one of the guiding principles of my work. When I was in Nairobi, Kenya, 1985, for the UN Women's Conference, you know, anywhere you go, they're gonna warn you what part of town you shouldn't go to, right? In New Orleans, it's the Ninth Ward. Well, in Kenya, it's Pumwani. But I had met some people, young man from the university, and we were getting along so well, they invited me to go with them to visit their grandfather. I said, well, where is it? He said, Pumwani. I said, oh, Lord. <laughs> OK, but I'm going with you. So we went, poorest part of Nairobi. When I went into the elder's home for a minute, I could have been in my grandmother's house. I could have been in my aunt's house in Marietta. You know. Old people have a culture. It was hot in there. They had stuff up on the wall. And so he thought I was from there. This grandfather, this man who was not formally educated, this man from the poorest, most oppressed community of Nairobi. And so the family told him, no, no, grandfather. She's from the United States. The old man started to cry. He said, thank God one of our daughters has come home. Don't ever feel ashamed about what has happened to you because you have a home. Now, you see, there's a lot of wisdom in that because that's exactly part of our miseducation. We have been made to feel ashamed about what has been done to us. Can you, can you follow that logic? We're the ones that's supposed to be guilty. So uh, I've also introduced the term heritage knowledge into my work. Uh, I directed teachers at uh, teacher preparation programs at Santa Clara University for 12 years. And um, at that time, back in the 80s, we didn't have a lot of um, scholarship on diversity and preparing teachers for diversity. In the 80s, that was just getting started. Now, any teacher preparation program you go to, you will hear the term cultural knowledge, right? Teachers need cultural knowledge. Well, I was not satisfied with that because I felt like, yes, teachers need cultural knowledge, but what do we have? When we come from a community, when we come from our tradition, we have a heritage. So we show up and our heritage knowledge should be valued. You see that subtle difference? So we want to underscore that there's a partnership here. Teachers need knowledge of other children's culture, but everybody needs knowledge of their own heritage. Everybody. So our ABCs are we are an African people. Blackness matters, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. And consciousness is our aim. That's our ABCs. 
We are African, blackness matters, and consciousness is our aim. Remember I said I could graduate from Stanford having lost my natural mind. I was talking to my grandmother on the phone one day. My roommates were in the room. That's when they had the old phone on the wall. I'm old, you know, the old phone on the wall, like a kitchen phone. So no cell phone, kids, just one phone. So after I got through talking to my grandmother, my roommates were looking at me like I had come from Mars. Their mouth was hanging open. I said, well, what? They said, we didn't understand a thing you said. And it occurred to me then, I had code switched. I had switched to my home language in talking with my grandmother. But it occurred to me that if I wasn't careful, when I finished at Stanford, maybe I wouldn't be able to talk to my grandmother anymore. Are you with me? So I became conscious of what was happening to me. Now, my family didn't have this orientation. They couldn't help me with that. They were just happy that I could go to a wonderful institution like Stanford and be educated. And the idea often in our families is, well, you know, you're going to get that education, and can't nobody take it away from you, and uh, we just, you know, we're just launching you. Not really articulating the expectation that I'm supposed to come back with that education and do something in the community. Are you with me? And a lot of our best teachers will tell children, you're going to make it out. You're going to get away. You're going to be the one. So we want to we wanna get, get away from that idea, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that. How do we protect the emotional and intellectual well-being of our children? Our ideas, our cognition, what we learn, the knowledge, but also our emotional makeup. How can young children be insulated, protected from assaults on their spirit? What happens to teachers in someone else's narrative? What do teachers need to know, be like, be able to do, and be like? That's all part of the equation of undoing the miseducation of black children. There's a role for teachers in schools. There's a role for parents. There's a role for community. We also have to look at the media. And I mean, there are lots of other influences. Raise your hand if you have heard of or know who is the brown condor. Look around the room, everybody. Nobody knows the answer to that question. The brown condor. Well, that's the brown condor. His name is John Robinson. And he came from Alabama, moved to Chicago, and wanted to be a pilot in the 1930s. Bessie Coleman, you've heard of the black woman pilot? Okay, so Lindbergh, you've heard of the Lindbergh. This was when aviation was just taking off. So John Robinson wanted to be a pilot. The pilot school in Chicago wouldn't admit him because he was black. So he took a job as a janitor sort of like the spook who sat by the door. And he's listening and watching and observing so closely that he learned how to build a plane from scratch. And when they discovered what he could do, they said, well, we're going to let you in. So he did become a pilot. And about that time, Mussolini and the Italians attacked Ethiopia. You know that history? Fascism, World War one World War II. So this brother from Alabama who had become a pilot decided he would go to Ethiopia to help defend the Ethiopians against the Italian colonization attempt to uh, dominate Ethiopia. He established the Ethiopian Air Force. He eventually became a Tuskegee Airman. And when he came back from Ethiopia after having won many battles and uh, he's wearing his Ethiopian pilot uh, Air Force uniform, he had a ticker tape parade in New York and another parade in Chicago with 500 cars going from the airport to the south side of Chicago. It was a huge affair. I asked this question in Chicago a couple of years ago at a national conference on race and racism. 
only one person in the room had ever heard of him in Chicago. And that person was a historian. Well, what is my point? How are we going to undo miseducation if we don't even know our own story? Why should we not know who this man is? Why, why should this be a mystery? What do you say to raise a liberated black child with a relevant personality? That man had a relevant personality. His personality was such that he could identify himself as an African and understand that he had an obligation and use his talents to help his people understood globally. Well, here's some recent research. African American youth are perceived as more adult-like and less innocent than their peers. When teachers look at photographs of African American children, they think they're older than they are. Might that help to explain what happened to Tamir Rice? when the police rolled up on him, a 12-year-old, and the policeman is afraid? Is he, was he thinking he's 25? African-American history is poorly taught and marginalized in high school history courses. African-American females with the darkest skin tone and African features are twice as likely as white females to be suspended from school. African-American girls risk being disciplined when they are perceived to violate racialized, gendered norms that dictate how respectable young ladies should behave. This is from the research. It's not just speculation. This is, I could cite the sources for this. This is the context un, in which we are trying to undo the miseducation of our children. So when a child comes home and tells you that this is what they've observed, what do you say? Do you, do you have the vocabulary? Do you have the concepts to raise a child in this environment? And what, what's the goal? These are questions the community has to discuss and decide. Well, in terms of those genderized norms of how a respectable young lady should behave, this is also the context. This is our first lady before she became first lady. Nude. So how are we going to talk to our children when this is where the society is going? What are you going to say? My four-year-old granddaughter is asking me, Nana, did you vote for Donald Trump? No, baby. <laughs> but they're, they're observing. They're thinking. They're aware. What is our language going to be? Not condemnation, but elevation. Toni Morrison, the great writer, and I used this line when I was raising my children. She integrated a school on the other side of town. And her father told her when she left home that day, remember, you go to school over there, you don't live over there. What does that say? That means you have some values, you have an orientation, that is not necessarily going to be supported by that environment. But you should not blend in and lose your natural mind. We have a moral obligation to counter alienating school knowledge that blocks black people's human right to be literate in our own heritage. That's our human right, to know who we are and where we came from. Other people can do that, but when we do it, it's a problem. We have a moral obligation to overcome white people's monopoly on what it means to be human. Now, I want you to put white people in quotation marks because I'm not talking about every individual white person. I'm talking about the concept of whiteness that prevails in this society. And you can have some white thinking black people. You can also have some black oriented white people. John Brown is one of my heroes. But he's presented in his textbooks like a madman. OK, writing, rewriting the curriculum is about racial socialization. What is the antidote to miseducation? Racial socialization. Everybody say that. Racial socialization. Well, what does that mean? It means preparing children to live in a world that is unfair based on race. They have to have explanations for that. They have to be able to understand what has happened here. What's ha what has happened to Auburn Avenue? 
what has happened to Claiborne Avenue in New Orleans? What has happened to Hayti in Durham? What has happened to the Fillmore in San Francisco? So the curriculum tells us certain things about our history that is very wounding. I mean, it's so dangerous. Africans sold their own brothers and sisters into slavery. You heard that? They teach that. It's still in the textbooks. Now, how are you going to feel when you're reading in the textbook or the teacher's telling you, well, slavery was your people's fault. Your people sold your people into slavery. I have a friend in Brazil, she said, when her husband was in school, an Afro-Brazilian, the teacher told him, he was the only black child in the classroom, the teacher told him he could go outside while they discussed slavery. Happening all over the world. So what will you say? This is from Malefi Asante's website. In other words, we have the resources, we have the scholarship, it's not a mystery, but we have to organize ourselves to use that knowledge and information. You can get the answer to this false half story of history from Malefi Asante's website, and I can tell you some other things. Our story does not begin with slavery, but with humanity's origins in Africa. Who traveled to Africa in search of captives? Who created an entire industry of shipbuilding, insurance, outfitting crews and ships and banking based on the slave trade? Who benefited from this vile crime? You see, it's a different orientation. We're not looking for blame. We're not looking for uh, villains. We're looking to understand what actually happened. So I'm going to kind of speed up here. Uh, my concept of diaspora literacy is about youth leadership, a pan-African identity, and um, consciousness for culturally situated citizenship. Uh, I don't have time to go into it. There's a story about my son and Malcolm X's birthday when he was six years old. I have a program called the Songhai Princess Clubs. If I have time, I'll talk a little bit about that. But this uh, here is a game that's online. It's called um, Play in History 2. And it's an interactive game created by some Dutch game developers. And it uh, directs the children to stack as many slaves into the hold of the slave ship as they can. Now, this is, um, this is technology, right? This is all about um, using advanced learning equipment. Are you following me? So we have to be vigilant on all fronts. This game itself created such an uproar that they took this part out. But the game is still available, and it's all about a little boy named Tim who was captured, and now he has to help the European slave owners capture more slaves. And then you had the story of the boy in Texas who texted his mother uh, about the um, textbook that said African slaves were uh, brought as workers to the United States. So in my work, we use the traditions of black thought, Woodson's miseducation, and black folks' ways of being to support human freedom, everybody's freedom from alienating knowledge, to support visionary parent education, and critical racial socialization at home and in the community. And racial socialization really does make a difference. It prepares children to defend themselves when they go to school and they encounter miseducation. But we have to recognize that children want to be a part of the group. They want to be accepted. They don't want to be different. So you may end up battling with your child to get that child to protect him or herself from what's happening in school. Um, that was part of why I organized parents when my children were in school. So we had a parent organization. We did a lot of activities to defend positive education in the community. Parents thought, well, if we just put some new curtains in the teacher's lounge and paint the teacher's lounge, maybe they'll treat our children better. So I went across town to one of my friends in a wealthy neighborhood, and I got their homework, and I brought it back to the parent group. And when they saw the difference between the homework the children were getting on the other side of town and what their children were getting, they said, forget about them curtains. We're going to deal with the curriculum. Um, so critical, race socialization. This is a, a real children's book that you can get. Grandpa is everything black bad. Well, what are our stories? 
I don't have time to go into all of my experiences, but I can tell you that when I was at Stanford University, I had to fight back against uh, miseducation and resist the pedagogy of racial superiority. So um, again, I don't have time to tell the whole story, but I was in a class on theory, the theory of achievement motivation, and the professor said that the reason why Native Americans were poor and on reservations was because there was a problem with their culture. And you could see that their culture was all wrong because of their folk tales. And Coyote, which is a trickster in Native American tradition, never wanted to work. So he said, you see, that's why they're poor, because of their culture. So I went to the neighborhood library and I got Mother Goose fairy folk tales, nursery rhymes, and African American folk tales. And I used his formula for evaluating achievement motivation. Had to give it a score. And I looked at, let's say, Humpty Dumpty. Humpty Dumpty sat on the wall. Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. All the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't put Humpty Dumpty back together again. Achievement motivation, zero. <laughs> Jack and Jill. Jack fell down and broke his crown. <clears throat> Jill came tumbling after. Achievement. <coughs> so we had quite a few examples. <laughs> Think on it now. <coughs> and uh, Br'er Rabbit. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> and the Briar Patch. Anybody know that one? So Br'er Rabbit been bothering the fox. And one day, he slipped, and the fox caught him. Children. The fox said, mm, I'm going to eat you for dinner tonight. Br'er Rabbit said, oh, please, Brother Fox, you can do anything. Just don't throw me in the briar patch. Brother Fox said, the briar patch? He said, yeah, you, you, you put me in the pot, but don't throw me in the briar patch. So the fox said, that's just what I'm going to do. I'm going to throw you in that briar patch. So he threw him over the fence. And uh, the rabbit's jumping up and down. Woo, I'm home. <laughs> Achievement motivation, 10. <laughs> so I wrote up my paper, used the formula that the professor had given us, and I got an A. Because I knew something about my heritage, right? And I knew what he was saying about the uh, Native Americans was not true. About seven years later, when I was teaching at Santa Clara University, the teaching assistant in that class, we were at a faculty party together. And she said, Joyce, do you remember that paper you wrote for Professor So-and-So's class? I said, yeah, I remember. I got an A. She said, <clears throat> We always wondered, was it your own work? So this is about the assumption of our intellectual inferiority, that we can't have our own independent thoughts. So we need research on curriculum. We need to be talking about the African presence in Mexico. We have an emerging um, Latino population here in Georgia. The Latinos coming from Mexico or wherever need to understand their own African heritage. Are you hearing me? Um, people in uh, Pacifica. I learned when I was in New Zealand that some of the um, Samoan people went back after they had been in Oakland and East Palo Alto where I live and they started the Polynesian Panthers. The black Indians of New Orleans, Asian American participation in the black freedom struggle. These are examples just to reinforce that we're not just talking about black people. We're talking about American history that needs to be retold, American history and culture. So this notion the slaves lost all they knew, Africans uh, sold their own brothers and sisters into slavery, it's a problem. I said conceptual blackness and conceptual whiteness is what we're talking about, even the language is a distortion of our humanity. Black sheep, black lie, black hearted. White lie, white is right, white angels. Is God white? This is the 
context in which we are trying to undo the miseducation of our children. This is a problem. <laughs> We got teachers dragging black children down the hallway. This happened a couple of weeks ago. The adultification, treating black children like little adults um, because they are perceived as more guilty, more threatening, even in preschool. So <clears throat> we have culture and heritage knowledge. This is just an example of how we have to rewrite what we understand about culture. Elvis Presley, the king of rock and roll, the copy. The original, Sam Cooke. So, now get this. Sam Cooke was conkifying his hair. You see, he got a conk, right? You know what a conk is? Now, put lie and straighten out his hair. So Elvis Presley, copying Sam Cooke, makes his hair look like Sam Cooke's hair. Do you get the twisted logic here? Just think about that. The black man trying to be the white man and the white man trying to be the black man. Yeah, trying to, got, got to complete that circle. So here's another example. Um, Y'all know about Johnny Otis? I grew up loving Johnny Otis. Johnny Otis was a white man who became a black man by choice. Married a black lady, became a black preacher and a musician, got a son who plays the blues named Shug. He's a white man, Greek. Changed his name to Johnny Otis. And maybe if I play a little of his tune, you'll remember. It's kind of my favorite too, it should be. We had so much good luck with this. Little hand jive, fellas. <laughs> Sister, got it. This is our generation music, kids. I know cat name way out with Y'all can rock. He got a cool little chick in my bed. He can walk and stroll and soon as cute. And do that crazy hand job. Papa told Willie, you'll ruin my home. Now, does that sound like a white man? <laughs> And this is another example I use in my classes. You can go in the pharmacy right now today, go in Walmart, CVS, and you can purchase volumizing shampoo. Who needs volumizing shampoo? What is volume? Make it thick, puffy, because otherwise it's gonna be flat and stringy. Are you with me? We're in a capitalist society that communicates messages to everybody. There's something wrong with you, but we got a product that will fix it. So the white woman has to go puff up her hair. The black woman got to go get something to make her hair bone straight. Money, money, money. Why do we need these kind of sayings and, and rhymes? Sticks and stones may break my bones. The black of the berry, yellow gone to waste. We still saying that? Socialization for academic and cultural excellence. A parent told a researcher the way you can identify an effective teacher in this school, a teacher who is effective teaching black children, that teacher can teach my child to hold her own in the classroom and not forget about her own in the community. Academic and cultural excellence is what we need, both sides. We need people who can think, invent, be smart, but who also have cultural consciousness and have been prepared racially for bias and to resist and to advance the well-being of the community. So, Baba Asa and Barbara Sizemore and Dr. Donald Smith said, excellence in education is much more than a matter of high test scores on standardized minimum or advanced competency exams. Excellence must prepare a student for self-knowledge 
and to become a contributing, problem-solving member of his or her own community and in the wider world as well. That's what John Robinson was about in the 1930s. But how many of our children are getting this orientation, no matter what their background? So in my work, I'm going to really go fast here to try to finish up. I use the Songhai language of West Africa. My husband is a Songhai from uh, West Africa, and we discovered some features of his language that are very powerful and healing to liberate our consciousness from society's myths. And of course, we do not start our story with slavery, so that means we have to know something about what was happening on the continent before slavery. Here's just an example of this language. Everything positive about blackness in the Songhai language is a mind blower. It will just stop your brain. They call the sun at the highest point of the day the black sun, Wanabibi. When they want water from the Niger River out in the middle of the river that's clean and pure, not from the edge where people are playing and washing their clothes, they ask for, give me some of that black water, Hari Bibi. They don't plant their garden until the earth is black, Labu Bibi. And their cosmology says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was black, Chini Bibi. And the black word has the power to make things move. There's one that I don't have on here. <clears throat> but again, I told you, every slide could be a whole day's workshop. Their concept of God, the word for God in the Songhai language is Irkoi. It means literally our God in us. So if, if you're speaking that language and you say God, what you're saying is our God in us. Now, wouldn't that give you a different conception of yourself in relation to the creator, if that's what your language gave you as a thought? So coming on down to the end, Tony Browder, who um, is wonderful scholar, historian, and he has a project in Egypt called the Asa Restoration Project. And he is the only African American who is leading an excavation of ancient tombs in uh, Kemet. He discovered last fall in the ceiling of a 25th dynasty tomb this Sankofa symbol. Now Sankofa is West Africa. So what is this Sankofa thing doing in ancient Egypt in the 25th dynasty? That means there's some knowledge of African people and our history and how the continent developed that we still don't even know. So the rap artist David Banner said, our situation is more psychological than people will admit. Black kids kill black kids for the same reason cops do. They see no value. Our aim is consciousness. Consciousness means identity restoration. Identity restoration requires consciousness. The purpose of identity restoration is for the resurrection of African people and the redemption of humanity. Get that really clear. We're not rising just to be dominating other people, but we are rising to elevate the whole of humanity. When black children are exposed, to proper cultural and character development, a new mental and spiritual phenomenon emerges. We call it consciousness. Consciousness is the expanded awareness of your place in the universe. And this is from my student's work, Chika Akua. He's a wonderful uh, educator and teacher trainer. He graduated from Georgia State last year. Dr. Akua says, our children need their character and their culture to speak to their consciousness. When this happens, they will be transformed by the renewing of their minds. With this new consciousness comes a new commitment to actively participate in the resurrection of African people and the redemption of humanity. So I talk about revolutionary parenting and pedagogy to help educators produce African um, community-centered knowledge for academic and cultural excellence. We need to use our culture as an asset in de defining learning environments we need Afrocentric principles to rewrite the curriculum for consciousness and identity restoration. And as I said, I'm using the Songhai African language for cultural recovery and heritage knowledge in a way to work with teachers and parents in what I call 
culturally authentic assessment. So that brings teachers and parents together in working on evaluating what children are learning and what they uh, should know and be like. The, reclama the reclamation of African identity um, involves us as African people, our creator and our ancestors choose us for certain opportunities. And my question is, how are you answering your call? Thank you. Thank you.